Tom, hearing the message from your dad, from Zig Ziglar on character. I mean, we're going to hear that our audience, this is an audience of aspiring people. Nobody is in this audience listening to this show, wondering if they can get by with not having good character, good morals. Uh, that's not the issue. But I am concerned just what the perspective is, what the perspective of our culture, especially of the youth is of that aspect of, am I going to be valued for the skill I have, right? This is the thing I've been taught how to do this. I have experience. I'm an expert. I'm a master at whatever. Uh, is that going to get me the job? Is that going to keep me the job? Is that, uh, is that going to make people loyal to me? You know, or is it on just being a good person? And you see people on both sides, you know, that, Hey, I should, I should be, I'm the best. I am the best surgeon. I'm the best car mechanic. I'm the best tech wizard, whatever. I, I'm the best. And we see that depicted in movies. I think that's a little bit of my concern is how we see it depicted. We have the movie out there and that's kind of that consummate concept of so-and-so is the whiz. They are the master. And even though they're a jerk or they may be a little dubious in their morality, it's okay. They're the master. And that's what gets them the acclaim. And that makes an interesting story. But in real life is that does that hold water? And then of course, on the other side, we've got somebody who may not be the best, which I mean, I guess for, I think for most of us in the workplace, how can you claim to be the best? I mean, there's no way I'm the best. Well, you say to the best podcast host ever, God bless you for that. Uh, probably hard to prove that I am the best uh, podcast host out there. And people are going to latch on to you for other reasons. They resonate with you. They do trust you. I think that that, I think I gain people's trust just like you do. And that's big. So over here, I have probably, when have I ever felt the best at anything? Not rarely, but I think I get people's trust. I relate to people. Well, you know, I'm a good guy, but we also have people who are on that side going, come on, I'm, I'm, I'm a good guy. I mean, well, I'm trustworthy. I'm honest. And they're not getting the opportunity because they may not have the, the skill, the acumen, they get, and they're frustrated that they get beat out by somebody who's got better marks, even though they're a jerk. And so again, we're not, you know, we're not, we're not, it's not an argument on, Hey, can you get away with not having good character and not good morals, but just where does it play out in the real world and how should we be perceiving it and pursuing it and trying to I guess a you know, showcase, but I mean, it is, we're, we're a walking resume. We all are in everything that we're doing. Um, why hire you? Why hire you to speak? Why hire you as a coach? Why work for you? I mean, that's the questions that were, that's what I wanted to battle around, Tom. So give me your first thoughts. Well, my first thought is uh, I just had a flashback. I was over in Ireland and I was speaking or actually I was being coached by a speaker coach, mm -hmm. uh, Paul Mussolides. And he's pretty well known over there working with uh, CEOs of the top 100 companies there, helping them on their presentations. So you're, so you're there in a, as a student? I'm a student. Okay. I paid big money to do one-on-one -on -one speaker training with him. Okay. And uh, fantastic. And he's also Shakespearean trained. He's also the voice coach for the epic TV series Vikings. Wow. Um, so because they had to recreate a language that nobody knows what it sounds like because there's only remnants of it left. Maybe yeah. they're, they're not even sure. Uh, and so he asked me, he said, uh, well, why do you speak? And I go, um, to please God. And he said, don't ever say that in Europe. Okay. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, what you want to do is you want to show up on stage just prepared and everything in order. And you want them to know that you have put in the time, energy, and effort to deliver the best presentation you've ever given. And then when you're done, if somebody says, why do you do, why are you a speaker? What motivates you? Then you can say to please God. And I okay. said, well, why is that? And he said, because over here, there've been too many people who get on stage and wing it. 
and they're not prepared and they don't do a great job and there's gaps in their presentation and they don't know their stuff and they throw out the, I'm, you know, this is part of my faith, right? Like that's a shield or that's an excuse or that's a reason. And that just always struck me. So when there's something really important in life, you want to go and find the absolute most qualified expert to help you handle that. And I, you know, and so that whole question of, you know, can you, can you, can moral character, can they, can you give it a pass on that? And I think it depends, right? So if somebody's moral flaw is sobriety, yeah, I think you probably pass on that person. Cause I don't want to go into brain surgery with somebody who maybe is still in or get on an airplane with a pilot who's maybe a little bit intoxicated. Right. Uh, but if, if it's something else that doesn't have a direct correlation to their ability to do the job right then, if it's my child, my, my own life on the line, I want the best in the world doing it. Well, and it's an appropriate time. So I literally listened to, you know, I was listening as I do to, to Zig's messages and looking for a relevant clip to pull out. And that one I pulled out and it was uh, alongside, however, as I'm listening to it, thinking, oh, this is appropriate because as we were just talking about my son, my oldest son, Caleb is currently in the hospital. So my wife is uh, just jetted across the country and he's there. He's got a long medical history and uh, just had something go wrong. And it's a relevant question for him. So he's, he's literally living this, you know, what, what do you want? And his response, I sent it to, I texted it to him was, gosh, I want the best surgeon, even if the person's a jerk, which we've had in the past with him literally had say, we all know that the surgeon, the, the consummate doctor surgeon, they're the best at what they do, but not a good bedside manner. That's the thing that we generally say, but I'm going to separate that out, Tom, because that's different than lacking morals. You could have a bad bedside manner and still be a good person. You're just not good at PR and relations. And I've seen some, we know, I mean, we see some of those industries where you have people, it seems to draw people who are super dialed in to what they do and they do it well. And it almost feels like by proxy, they don't have great personal relationship skills. You're smiling. What are you thinking of? I've just, I've been in the room with that doctor. I was, we had a family member have a surgery and he said, are there any questions? And I had a question and he looked at me and said, that's a stupid question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and if and you I, think he's a good surgeon, you may have forgiven him for that. Oh, actually he said, that's the wrong question. Okay. Uh, but he said it with that tone that said, that's a stupid question. And then I remembered that saying there are no stupid questions, only stupid people. Yeah, and I well. felt like a stupid person. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah, there was no doubt this guy was highly qualified to do what he did. And we would have picked him over again. But it's just ironic. Yeah, because that's you know, that's something he needs to work on, but that's not necessarily like you said, that's not a moral a moral failing. It, it, right. And we see that again, depicted in, I mean, we experience it in real life and see it depicted in the movies. And it's the, again, the tech wizard or the brilliant doctor or whatever. And they kind of have that feeling of, man, they're not going to mess around with trying to make you feel good. And they're going to answer the, you know, they're just going to be direct and you just have to deal with it, but they're the best. But I'm afraid that that pervades our culture. And we get people going in the workplace thinking that they're going to get by with that. I don't, generally see that working well, that if you do not have bedside manner, what I find is you often don't get the opportunities that would allow you to be the brilliant person. Again, there may be anomalies here and there, but generally everybody at some point, man, if you don't have some bedside manner, you're not even going to get the opportunities to be able to be that master at what you're doing. Now, again, it's different than having lacking of morals. And we had a lot of people, it was really such a diverse, we had a lot of responses on this and really in depth ones. And it was so much that it was, I had a hard time culminating uh, that, you know, here, I'll, I will read one Jennifer Meisel. She says, am I the only one who is going to pick the best surgeon? Cause we had a lot of people say, Oh, you know, morals, but she said, maybe the questions should be more clear. Do you want the best surgeon with no morals or not a good surgeon with great morals? Of course, having great morals makes you a better surgeon, but if it's pure tech skills needed, 
I'm going with the best skilled. It's not the same answer if I'm picking a sports team member because morals do help the team. I guess surgeons do not uh, do too, but not at the level that a team does. So granted. So if you've got my gosh, you know, if it's, if, if you're, if you're, you know, look at a tech thing and everything crashed yesterday, Spotify crashed. It was all in the, all in some, in some of the social media news, Spotify crashed, which was, it was, I, I almost had a panic attack. I mean, without my music, I literally I was getting ready for go to, to go for a run. And I was wanting to listen to some specific music, couldn't get logged in and found out that they're down. Um, you know, you want that, you want, the person who is in the movies, the person who can get on there and wail away with their fingers and fix it right away. Right. You know, and stop the nuclear bomb and all that kind of stuff. You don't care what their morals are and whatnot. Again, I don't know that that is true to real life. I don't know how many positions really are going to be relevant for that person. And what I've seen and what a lot of people tested attested to is even if you do have that person, if they really are lacking morals, there's other things in play. And my son did have a surgeon that we used a long time ago. And there was a problem with the surgery. There was something that went wrong and he was one of the best. And because of his literal lack of morals, the cleanup of the issue afterwards uh, was really bad, was really bad. And in that case, my thought would be, I wish we had not gone with the best, but somebody who had morals because something went wrong, then the aftermath can really go downhill. So it, this whole topic has got me thinking about, do I ever really want to go to the best if it's at a deficit of character? It's a hard, I, I'm, I'm feeling less led to, to side with that at this point. Yeah. And it's, and I, I think the depends and the clarity are two big features in this question. Yeah. Um, like I said about sobriety, um, you know, I think you always long-term success over and over dependability, you got to have a solid moral foundation. And then in different cases, the words that we use and the meaning behind them have, we're just talking about the medical situation, but those have huge healing powers. Like if you come in and, and you have hope and encouragement and and all those bedside manners and it's backed up with a track record of just dependability and great moral standing then that faith and trust in those words is going to go up and that's going to help the healing process uh yeah so i i don't know i mean gosh it's it's a great question so i guess when's the when's the point that at what point does a certain lack of moral impact performance in the, in the, in the, yeah. in the finite measurable today realm. You know, there's a couple of movies talk, I keep bringing that up just because they exaggerate these depictions and you keep talking about uh, sobriety, Tom, did you see the movie flight? I think it was called flight with Denzel Washington. Hmm. I don't and think I did. It's, it's a, it's a little dated now, but it was about, I'm, I'm not sure. It might be based on a true story he's a pilot. So in this thing, he's a pilot and an alcoholic, a, a really, really bad alcoholic. And so he's flying, something literally goes wrong with the plane outside of it didn't have anything to do with his alcoholism. And he, because he is such a, an amazing pilot, he saves, he saves the day. He saves everybody. It's un, you know, unprecedented. And again, it, it may be based on a true story. If not, they you know, made a really good story out of it. And he did, he saved everybody. And afterwards, they found out that he had alcohol in his system. And it kind of goes back and forth of forcing you to look at it. On one hand, he did an amazing job. He was the master. So outside of anything, he saved the day. He saved the ship. He saved the, you know, the airplane and everybody inside it. And he wasn't sober. And so it makes you it makes you dis, uh, you know, discern this, this issue and what really is right and wrong. And now, and well, shoot, I don't want to give a spoiler alert, you know, for someone ultimately they, they said to some, you know, to that degree, it was not okay. Anyways, that he was not sober. There's another movie and both of these are not, you know, child appropriate and, and some people aren't going to like them, but uh, they do bring to light these issues. There's another movie. It's been a while now called crash. And it's a similar thing. And it starts off with some pretty, 
uh, gritty lack of morality shown. And then it does a, an about face and shows the same person and shows the struggles that they're going through. And it does show some integrity, but it makes you grapple with this very issue. And again, we're not here debating whether any of us want to get away with a lack of morality and a lack of character. My, again, concern, though, is as we look at our own pursuit of success, our own progress, we look at running businesses and leading people, working for people, getting a job, whatever, what is going to get us the opportunity? What is going to make people loyal to us? And my feeling culturally right now, and you tell me what you think, Tom, is that we are today erring more so on the side of skill. We think that we should have the opportunity and we should have the loyalty of our employer, of people, whatnot, because of our skill. And I'm afraid that we're seeing a lot of people who are disappointed and dismayed when that doesn't happen. The degree does not get them what they want it to. The skill does not get them what they want it to. And they're frustrated and getting bitter over here because they're missing out on the character, or maybe we should say the, the portrayal of character, which you and I have done some shows recently on trust. It's one thing to be to have ethics and morals and to know you're trustworthy. It's another thing to do the things that help people feel that from you. You can miss it still. What do you think? Yeah, well, I definitely feel like the, the culture is saying, well, you know, what they do in their own personal life or how they handle that situation is no big deal. Yeah. Um, a lot of people look past uh, our president, whether it's, a, a womanizing issue or uh, <laughs> Democratic or Republican past presidents, doesn't matter. They say, well, you know, they got the skills to go and do it. Uh, and so that's a, you know, we look past that and we think, wow, that's, that's something that we'll tolerate. And then it catches up. I know in, in the military or in the CIA or in any of these elite institutions where you have to have top secret clearance and they go deep in the background check uh, around drugs, financial status, all of these different things, debt, because all of these are points of compromise that the enemy can use against you, right? So if you're in a lot of debt, uh, and haven't handled your personal finance as well, you might not get top secret clearance because the enemy can say, hey, we'll pay, we'll get you out of debt. Just, just do this one thing. Uh, if you are, if you have a track record of infidelity, they'll set a trap for you and be able to blackmail you. Yeah. Uh, and so these are all real world moral issues that, our own elite government agencies say are cause for concern. But then we sweep it aside when it's an athlete who um, has done some horrible things, but yet nobody can do what they can do on the field. Or they're a politician and they've got the golden charisma touch and the high poles, but at the same time, they're doing things in other areas where you go, that's just not right. You know, it's, it's just not right. And so, yeah, I think, I think it's a really, um, it's an interesting dynamic that we say it's okay here, but it's not okay here. Okay. I'm literally, I did a, a, just a, a second pause there because we may edit this out. You ready, Tom? Seriously, we may just edit this right out. We don't do it on the political uh, path here. We always joke about that things. We're not going to talk about here on the show. Uh, so we may delete this out. So here you and I'll talk. And if we don't like it, we will, because we obviously had a, a, a president in office and we had some responses to this question that I posted here, that this show is on. And we had some people, we had a lot, of, we actually had some that I deleted. It, it kind of went downhill. Some of the ones on the political aspect, but had some talk about our past president. And it was somebody who was an advocate of our most recently past president, Trump. I don't need to beat around the book. And it was obviously somebody who was pro 
Trump. And they were frustrated at, they felt like he was obviously doing a good job. They liked his competency and were frustrated that he was uh, diminished because of some of the lack of what they, you know, some of the seeming lack of character that he was putting out there. They talked about Twitter tweeting stuff out there. And that's interesting because, okay, so without trying, I'm trying to, to obviously measure my words here without taking sides, but that's interesting. To, there's a good example of somebody, let's say that he was competent, which a lot of people are not going to agree with, but let's just say he was. I personally was bothered regardless by the spirit that he was putting out there and the negative effects of that. And I think that that's relevant. So let's say that we have a, a boss, you know, who's very good at their job, but they are uh, putting out some negativity or some things that are troubling to the company, to the employees, man, that does have an impact, a direct impact to the culture, to the spirit, to the bottom line. So this is not a, can I say that? Am I doing a, am I, am I uh, balancing the waters there? I'm not being pro or, you know, anti you know, Trump or anything there, but just to say, that's a good example of is the competency in and of itself good enough because my feeling is man if you've got some negativity underneath that it's going to have tangible consequences as well and we've got to balance that you know because conversely do you want to put somebody in who's not as competent but they have better spirit that's a relevant balance to look at yeah and so let's look at it okay. um and we'll just we'll just pick on two presidents. We'll pick on Trump and we'll pick on uh, Bill Clinton. Okay. Um, you know, dad, dad has a definition of success. He's, he said that success is the maximum utilization of the abilities that God gave you. And I heard somebody once say that uh, Bill Clinton had the opportunity to perhaps be the greatest president in the history of presidents between his intellect, his charisma, his ability to connect with people. Um, he got a, a policy push through that was called uh, welfare to work that brought 3 million people back to work. And he did it at great political sacrifice because his own party wasn't supporting it. Hmm. And so he, he brought enough of them and the other side together to get it done. Um, and, and yet he had a moral failing that sabotaged his influence, that sabotaged his ability to get other things done. And I'm not speaking as whether you agree with him or not. I'm just saying from a historical perspective, uh, if, if, if he had had a little bit higher moral character and stayed within those boundaries, uh, his impact and his ability to unite people could have had just a significantly greater impact on the way the United States moved forward. Yeah. I'm not advocating whether it's good or bad. Uh, I'm just saying that's what happened. Well, then you look at Trump and you, you look at, um, you know, once again, success is, is the maximum utilization of the abilities, the gifts that God's giving you. Uh, how did his demeanor, the way he treats people, uh, his questionable uh, deal making, <laughs> and I'm being, I'm not going deep into it. I'm just yeah. saying how many enemies has he created along the way because of that. Um, and I think we all know more than we want to know about what's gone on there, but he, he sabotaged himself mm -hmm. in those behaviors. Um, and so to me, it doesn't matter whether you like what he was trying to get through or didn't like what he was trying to get through both of both, uh, gloriously fell short. Yeah. And I don't know if those are two words you can put together. <laughs> I, I like it actually. Gloriously, Gloriously fell, I mean, fell short. They, they yeah. snatched. Yeah. They snatched I, defeat from the jaws of victory, you know, just yeah. uh, in a, 
in a, in a couple of situations. And so you can't really, gosh, you, when it comes to impact and influence and doing good short-term and long-term, it's very difficult to separate, Hey, technically, you know, having a control over it and then, but had being a moral, um, idiot, uh, they catch up, they go hand in hand. Well, and of course we all, we would like to have both. We would like to be both and we would like to have both. And actually people started off answering my question that way. And I had to go back and edit it to say, no, I'm making you pick sides. And it's, uh, well, well, here, here, let me, let me read this. Marla uh, Carrico. She posted, here's a great stat from Buffini and company. She's talking about Brian Buffini. He's a friend of Ziegler. Uh, got a huge podcast, by the way, it was called the Brian Buffini show. And he just changed the name to it's a good life, something along that nature, I think. So she's referencing him uh, or his company. And it, apparently his stat that he shared was people value character at 40% and competency at 60%. Don't know where that stat or research came from, but she said, that's why sometimes you don't use a service provider. You have a relationship with, if you think someone else will do a better job, which is interesting because I right away, right away went to the other side and there's oftentimes where I have used a service provider specifically who I was not convinced that they were the actual best at it, but I trusted them. And it brings me back to that, to like, to saying, let's say we have a surgeon and this was an experience that I literally had with my son who may have technically been the best. But if we look at that, whether it's a surgeon or somebody working on tech stuff or your car or whatnot, let's say they're the best. What happens if there is a mistake or a problem? Nobody is above that. So if I've got a doctor, he's the absolute best. Here's another one who's 20% less in capacity capability. And your thought is, well, gosh, man, if it's a surgeon, I just want the best. Okay. If everything goes as planned, that may work. But what if there is a problem, how are they going to react morally, ethically, whatnot? And if the aftermath of that is, is horrendous because of their lack, then you would go back and say, gosh, no, I'd, I'd rather, my thought is you'd question whether you did want the technically the best because things are not always going to go as planned. And you can look at that. And what if there's a mistake? What about the money over here? What if you have somebody and yeah, they're the best, but man, they are going to bilk you for all they can you know, financially, does that outweigh it then? And that's what you're talking about somewhat when we look at, yeah, like a, a great a presidency is a great place. There's no way everything's going to go according to plan. There's no way that things are not going to go south. Things are going to happen. Wars are going to happen. And now we're going to rest, not just on their competency, but on their morality. And it makes a strong case for lessening the value. That sounds bad, doesn't it? Lessening the value of the competency of the skill and putting the morals and ethics and character at a higher degree. And, and, and the, again, the point is looking at, I wanted people to own this. And, you know, Tom, as you're thinking about, I mean, there are people that we hire every day, whether it's a surgeon, a car mechanic, an accountant, or whatnot. And we're talking, even there, you would think an accountant, man, I want the absolute best. It's going to help save me as much money as possible. Okay, but what if they charge you twice as much? What if they skim off your profits? Is that okay? And you would go, well, of course not. Well, and, and again, we don't want to have to pick, but it does behoove us then to own it then and go, what are we? I mean, well, I guess when it comes down to it, is what are our what are we doing to gain people's trust? And at the end of the day, are you gonna is Tom Ziegler gonna have as much opportunity long term? because you are just the best speaker that's ever hit the stage, even though you may not be when you get off stage. I feel like it comes around. I feel like it's just, we're in too much of a glass world. Yep. It does. And, you know, we just had our first Ziegler coach leadership program class. We just had it the last weekend, two days, packed room, elbow to elbow. And there were three main components of the of the two days, the mindset of a leader, you know, how do we think? And the, the, the bulk of it was the 10 virtues that a, that a leader needs to walk out. 
And then the third piece is the intentional coaching conversation. How do you coach up your performers and the top performers on your team? And so the, the big question and, and where we spent most of the time is in the morality of those 10 virtues. And so the question that always comes up is, okay, so uh, somebody's on your team and they're not performing, what do you do? And so here's two rules of thumb. So we're moving it from theory to practice. So in most situations, you go through all the steps you need to go through to hire the best person possible. <laughs> and what you want is somebody who's dependable and trustworthy and has the character, the reliability. Uh, you, you hire all that and you want them to be competent or coachable and trainable so they become competent. So when do you start having red flags, not around mistakes, because we embrace mistakes. And as people are learning, they're going to make mistakes. Uh, but where do, where do mistakes become a red flag? And so there's really two areas. One is, is when the same mistake is made repetitively. Right. And you've, you've, you've exhausted all avenues. They're just not getting it. So it's might not be a fit. That's where, that's where the incompetence comes in, right? That's a technical ability to do yeah. something. They're just not the right person with the right capacity to get that done. But you have to find out, are you teaching them the right way? Do they have a different learning method, you know, way of learning? Right. The other is a virtue issue. So when, if you have, and I, I believe every business organization, agency, nonprofit, profit doesn't matter, you should have a state, stated list of values and virtues that this is how we treat each other. This is what, this is what 10 leadership virtues for disruptive times. That's what the book is all about is you've got to come together and say, Hey, here are the virtues. This is the standard I'm holding myself to. And, and these are the virtues that we're going to interact with each other on. And so if that standard is broken, that's a red flag. When there's a, when there's a moral ethical, standard that's broken, that's got to be addressed. I was in a training one time with, with uh, Joe Calhoun, and he does a lot of uh, leader training. And so I asked him, I said, gosh, you know, is there ever a time where somebody messes up and they're just done, right? I mean, I'm not talking about murder or assault or some criminal offense. I'm just talking about They've done something that is so harmful that they can't be recovered. And, and he basically said there is, and it's, he says, it's not, it's not always black and white, but basically what you look for is this, does somebody do something that benefits themselves at the expense of someone else? And I've always thought, wow, there's some wisdom in that. It doesn't mean that somebody might do something spontaneously or way out of character or in unusual circumstances that there can't be redemption and forgiveness and redeeming and all those different things. It doesn't mean that's not possible. It just means that in an environment, when you see somebody make a decision that benefits themselves at the expense of someone else, that's when it's a good time to start considering whether this relationship needs to transfer to somebody who doesn't make decisions that way. Right. Yeah. And, we see, and we see it all the time. What we do. I mean, it brings back that thing that we say in the world of employees so often, you know, you hire character, you can teach skills and we say that, but I feel like it doesn't really take, root. And yet, you know, has anybody ever been out there? Well, I was going to say who's hired somebody, but even if it's a coworker and you recognize their skill, but it's just not worth it because of their, you know, bedside manner. And uh, Tom, I, I know you're, I, I know you, and I'll, I can speak for you on this one, just like I can myself. And there's nobody, there's nothing that's worth working with somebody alongside somebody who just brings you down who, who permeates a bad spirit. I mean, I just, I've never been involved in anything that was, that was worth that. Maybe I haven't been in anything critical enough, but I just, I, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine. And 
and you brought up something too, you know, that I mean, at some point we probably experienced this, or you've seen, you've seen this happen where there's somebody who they are amazing at what they do, but they're just, you just can't count on them. And I've, I've had two experiences, Tom, that were really hard for me. Uh, really sad where it was both, it happened to be with receptionists uh, at businesses where they were great. It was, it, it was females both time. I know it's stereotypical, but it, it was, it was females. They were really good. They were sweet people. They were good people. Everybody loved them, but they were so, uh, they were, they were not dependable. Gosh, we had somebody who cleaned as well, like a cleaning lady. Um, again, she was great. She went above and beyond. She would not just clean, but she'd bring flowers and she would do extra things. I mean, everything you could want. And yet all three instances, they were so undependable that at some point we just, when we come in Monday and you haven't, and you don't show up, we've got to have somebody at the front desk. Even if they're not as good as you, we've got to have somebody who's actually cleaned over the weekend. It was so heartbreaking to let them go, but their skill and their acumen did not uh, overcome their lack of reliability. And I, I'm not going to say that was a lack of morals and character and some, and, and a couple of them, they had some really hard things going on, but man, at the end of the day, you still got a business and you still just have to have somebody there. And that is the depiction that we, we get a lot. And, and that's what we're juggling here is this aspect. And you brought up too, uh, yeah, looking at your values made me think again of our friend, Dina Dwyer Owens, who wrote the book values Inc. Where they, was it every day or every week they get together as a whole company and read through their mission I statement values? Yeah. But what I remember about it is anytime that there's more than uh, more than two people in the meeting or more than two employees of the company in the meeting, they read their, they recite their values and mission yeah. out loud. Okay. And so every time they have a meeting, a team meeting, a company meeting, whatever. And what's even more interesting is that when they meet with vendors and prospects and customers, they do the same thing. They, yeah. they do this little thing. And part of it is hold me accountable. Yeah. Yep. And that's, that's a powerful thing. So it's great to put it on the wall and, and say, this is what we believe. It's a whole nother level when it becomes the, the rhythm and the heartbeat of the organization and anybody at any level in the organization can call somebody out at any level for not fulfilling the, the, the values of the business. Well, ultimately, Tom, and again, there were so many responses. I, I really didn't know how to do them justice. A lot of them were about doctors. If anybody wants to go look at the post that I did, it's Facebook. You can find me at Agent K Miller. And I posted this, gosh, probably March 6th or 7th of 2022. And a lot of really in-depth sharing. And a lot of them were about doctors. And most of them talked about instances with, you know, a very good, orthopedic surgeon or cancer doctor or whatever, but then when something went wrong, the lack of morality hurting on the backside. And I think it culminates for me and Tom, you and I did a show. I wish I had the episode in front of me. I think it was, this is 2022. It might've been at the end of last year and it was on trust and not being trustworthy, but that back to what I said a minute ago on, it's one thing to know that we're trustworthy. It's another thing to do the, to, to, to act in a way that helps people understand you're trustworthy. I think a lot of people just in that same, in the same scenario we're talking about here, they know they are trustworthy. They have integrity, they are honest, and they're not benefiting from that. And, and that can be frustrating too. We have to showcase that we have to do the things. And if you're an influencer, there are literal ways to, to help you do that. So that's what we talked about in that show. And this one has me coming back to at the end of the day, we're talking about what is the greatest value. And Tom, it has me thinking back to, I mean, of course you got to be good at what you do and the better you are, the better, more opportunities you're going to have and the better things are going to be all around. However, I'm going to put at the top of the list. If I could have one thing, can I, would I choose that? Would I choose to have 10% more skill as a podcaster right now that I could wave a magic wand if the genie came out of the bottle and say, Hey, you pick, you get one or the other. Would you like to have 10% more skill? Or would you like to have 10% more perceived trust 
right now, man, if I'm, if I'm literally selfishly looking at my wallet, I'm going to say, I'll take the trust. I think it pays off kind of back to Dina with values Inc. I think it pays, which was, you know, that was fun to have her on the show. Not only does she believe in values and doing the right thing and having good morality, but she said it actually pays off. We did $2 billion last year. Uh, I like that. I like that. So that's a good sales pitch there. Uh, so bottom line, I'm, I'm going to pick trust. I'll take the 10% more trust. I think it pays off to my bottom line more so than skill. Again, be great to have both, but if I'm going to err on one side, yeah, Tom, I'm going to go, I'm going to go with, with trust. That's not an altruistic righteous thing. I'm just being bottom line selfishness. The interesting thing is, is if you, if your primary goal is like Seth Godin, which is to sell, to scale trust. Yeah. If that's your goal, then that's going to drive almost the relentless pursuit of improving your skill because you can't continue to scale trust and disappoint people on the skill side. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. If your goal is to scale skill, like get better and better and better trust doesn't necessarily follow. True. It actually has me. I just, I thought I forgot about this, Tom, a quick, real quick story. I was going to wrap us up, but real quick back when I waited tables. So this was kind of in my early elite cycling days and I was waiting tables and I would wait tables at fancy restaurants where you get big tips. So, you know, fine dining, the wine presentation and, and all that kind of stuff. I am not uh, great with details. It's not, that's not a skill set of mine. Don't hire me for details. Uh, even if you can trust me, don't hire me for details. Uh, I would, inv I was, I was pretty bad at forgetting items, especially appetizers. And so it was a bad habit. No, uh, no excuse, but I would do that. And here I come with their main meal and they never got their appetizer. Well, you can't fix that. Here's their meal. It's hot and ready to go. I can't go back in time and give them their appetizer to enjoy in the meantime. So it's a pretty bad mistake. I, I always felt horrific and I would go above and beyond. I am so sorry. I can't make up for that. Uh, dessert is on me. You guys pick it out totally on me. And what I realized it took me a while and realized that when I did that, when I overcompensated, I got better tips. It was real tempting to do it on purpose and just to, you know, to do that. Even if I had to pay the, you know, the cost of the dessert, I get a, I I'd get like these 27% tips. That was like a common percentage that I would get. And it was interesting to see that my competency, I could overcome that with good character, with caring, you know, in that. And, and I do look at that. And I thinking back to people talked about service providers and I have had people who have made mistakes that I was upset about. I was frustrated with, and when they go above and beyond to really take care of you, I mean, those are the people that I'm loyal to. They're the people that I refer others to and that I, I have trust in. Again, we would rather have both. It would be better if I would do great service and not forget your appetizer. So uh, that's, that's not, I'm not making a, an excuse for that or saying that's a good methodology, but it, uh, it is a good little microcosm of what we are talking about here because uh, coming back again to trust, just as you said. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, good topic to grapple with. Thanks again for all the responses. I wish I could have done those more justice, but uh, Tom, brother, thanks for your insight. Thank you. Be blessed.